Welcome back to another edition of Talking Tilton. I am Al Lockwood. We are here with Paul and Alice Blaisdell on this episode. And how are you guys doing today? Very well, thank you. We're very good, Al. Thank you so much for having us. My pleasure. So glad that you guys stepped up. I always love doing these interviews, and it's a great way to create an audio time capsule. And all right, Alice, I've got to kind of jump right in with this because you grew up on a farm in Belmont, and I know the area very well. Um, okay. Tell me a little bit about that, because it had to be interesting. Yes, uh, we had a very old farm on Union Road in Belmont. Uh, it had started out as a smaller home, and then they added to it a larger home, and then they added to that a huge three-story barn. So that's the, where I grew up, and I, I had one sister and five brothers. So that's, uh, my what, you, mother, that's what you call a full house. Yes, it was. We were busy all the time, and we, we just loved being at the farm. Uh, my mother's name was Eva. She's passed away. My dad's name was Ellis. He passed away. And all of my brothers and my sister have passed away. Older brother Edwin, older sister Millie, older brothers Melvin, David, Robert, then I came, and then my younger brother Roger passed away. So I'm the only one in the family left. Oh, wow. So uh, tell me about the farm itself. Uh, there, I, I've always been curious about living on a farm, and, and people have always said that it's a lot of work. Yes, but it was, it was good. It was good. Um, I grew up on the farm in Belmont, and as in all farms, the chores were a big part of the daily life. My brother, we didn't have running water. My brother had to go down to the well with uh, a couple buckets of water and pump and use the hand pump and pump up water it would uh, that would be his ch chore and when he got to the door he'd say open the door <laughs> <laughs> and that's when we all ran to open the door because he had two big buckets of water oh my goodness and, yeah and uh, us girls always help my mom with everyday chores we helped with the laundry. We had a, a ringer washing machine. Of course, we had to heat the water on the wood stove. And uh, we would start out with the white and wash it and wring it and put it through the ringer into the rinse bucket and then from the rinse bucket into the basket and then take that outside and hang it on the clotheslines. And... Uh, so what, I always what, helped my mother with everyday chores like that. What year are we talking about here? We're probably talking about 1940. Oh, wow. Okay. Mom, Mom was born in 36, so this would be throughout the 40s. You know, I always said I was born about 20, 30 years too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, and, and, and it was definitely a different lifestyle. What how early did your day actually start? Oh, well, we had to get ready for school. And uh, we didn't do any farm work before we went to school. Okay. So uh, that was not a problem. But when we got home from school, we always had chores to do. I don't remember specifically what my brothers did. They, they worked outside. And... Uh, as a child, I loved holding my little baby chicks. We had a hen house, mm -hmm. and of course they had they laid eggs and, and they made chickens for us. Um, we had a cow, mm -hmm. Elsie the cow, and she pr provided milk for the family. Uh, my dad a lot of cattle at one time, okay. but in my time, he only had the one cow, Elsie. One thing, Al, that, that I've discovered while... Well, looking back through my mom's yearbooks and photographs and the like was that her parents kept the family very busy with social activities related to both the community and the school. 
Okay. There, it seemed like the. I, I don't know how they did it. They had so many things going on with the with the seven children, well six at that point. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, they they were always doing something at the school, sports or activities or clubs, um, and of course they uh, they spent a lot of time at the Grange also, which we'll get into a little bit later. Yeah, that had to be a little bit rough because you figure with everything going on at the farm. And then dealing with six kids and trying to take care of all of them and then getting involved in the community. You guys had to put in some long hours of the day between everybody in the family. Yes, and my father uh, was the founder of Winnesquam Fire Department. Really? Uh, and my father was always, uh, he also had offices in the in he had was an officer in the Winnesquam, Winnesquam fire department fire department and okay. the B Belmont um, town offices my when my mom was a child her um the elementary school that she attended was the Gale school in Belmont okay which as we all know has recently been moved and is in the process of being restored we can talk about that in a little bit because my mom's got some really interesting stories about the Gale School and mm -hmm. her experience there. I, I remember seeing that on Facebook and I'm thinking, oh my God, they're moving a school. <laughs> That's got to be crazy. Oh, yes, they moved. Well, they, they, it was a big, a big event. But anyway, Elsie the Cow provided the milk for our family. Mm -hmm. And I started driving around. I was 11 years old. 11 years sitting, old? Yeah, but I was sitting in my daddy's lap steering oh, okay. the car. My, I think my, well, I always claim that I was my dad's favorite. He <laughs> waited along. Uh, to, he had so many sons. And then when I was born, he just went overboard. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> safe to say maybe daddy's little girl? Oh, definitely, because he would let me dip my donut into his coffee every morning. Oh, see, there you go. That proves yeah, it. And, and things like that. And I, one time my brother had a little squabble with me, and he threw a baseball and hit me. Oh, boy, did he ever get it from Daddy. Wow. Oh, bad. Wow. His, his poor little girl got hit by a baseball. Uh huh. Well, I, <laughs> I, I don't I, think I would have wanted been on the other end of that. No way. No, no. Oh well, Daddy could uh, he could take care of the boys pretty well. I'm sure. Just probably uh, had uh, to give them the look, and that was it. Yes, yes. I I got a driver's license. I I think I got it at 16. I don't even know if you could get a license at 16, but. I, if not 16, I was 17, and my father wouldn't let me drive alone unless I had a license. And I drove to school in Belmont for a while. Yeah. You've got to remember back then, paved roads were not common, so... Yeah. They were all dirt roads. They were cow paths, yeah. and um, yeah, uh, to think of the old Model A's and, and early cars... You know, they were basically wagons with engines in them. Yeah. They were not they were not so easy to drive. No, and they didn't have that great a suspension, so trying to drive them over rough roads, you were probably bouncing all over the place. Well, they were all dirt roads. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> it's, the town would come and plow in the winter, but they would use a big roller instead of a plow. Oh, yeah. called it plowing, but they, they, they rolled it. And they would come in. Of course, we lived quite a ways away from the town. But when, uh, when, they, when the people were busy cleaning the roads up of snow, they would uh, kind of stop at my dad's house. And he always had a barrel of cider down in the basement. Hmm. And they just enjoyed themselves for a little while, and then they got back on their roller and rolled some more snow. Wow. 
Now, you switched schools to Laconia High School, too, right? Yes, I did. I, I wanted to be, I, I changed schools to Laconia as a junior because they could teach me Latin. And okay. the reason I wanted Latin was because I had planned to be a nurse. My right. aunt was a nurse in the army, and she had me all set up to go to nurses training in her place in Maine. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I had to take Latin, and I had to take two years of it at Laconia High School. And I made out pretty well. I, I got very good. All of my family got A's and B's. There was no, no, no C's or anything? No F's? <laughs> uh, no, no F's. Okay, well that's always a good thing, because I know when I went to school, if I got like a C or a D, I was doing okay. Right. <laughs> well, uh, as since I had to go to Laconia, it made maybe about a five-mile drive. And I, my, my brother-in-law had a Model A window coupe, and I drove that car to school for two years, and I was the, I was the princess of the travel, no because kidding. all of, all the, none of the kids had Model A's at that time, and they just thought it was the most wonderful thing in the world, and then we'd all come out and sit on the. Uh, on the Model A and, oops, smoke a couple cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so you we must... Had get, so, we had to get off high school property, but it was just across the street, so no problem. So you were the popular girl in school? Well, more or less, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And did you yeah. ever end up becoming a nurse? No. As a matter of fact, I graduated from Laconia High School in 1954. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Within a week of that graduation, I was married. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I met an army sergeant who had been in who, Vietnam. Korea. Mm -hmm. He had been in Korea. Yeah, he just got home from Korea, and I met him, and I didn't have any other boyfriends or anything in school. We didn't go out with anybody, uh, but this guy kind of got my heart, and we were married for, oh, I don't know, a long time. And then he, he left after all the kids were born and, mm. and all, everybody was situated, and he remarried. And then I was a widow for four years, and then I met Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful, uh, an army person, and uh, he, he was at, out of the service at that point, but he was the love of my life. Oh, I so, I love everything, that. Everything turned out very well. Nice. So tell me a little bit more about the Gale School. Oh, Gale School uh, was, uh, my father went there. It would have been the <coughs> early 1900s. Where's that black? Um, anyway, my, my parent, my father went to Gale School. And at one point, they had a 25th year reunion. So that so this reunion was held in 1935, mm -hmm. and it was the 25th reunion of the class of 1910. And if I recall correctly, there were either nine or ten students who graduated right. in 1910. So that would have been he would have been 14 years <laughs> old. So that was probably eighth grade, and. So they had a reunion, and my mom has some wonderful pictures of her dad in his graduating class in 1910. And then in 1935, all of the graduates, except for one, went to the reunion, and they lined up in the exact same um, profile as they did in 1910. So you got to see these people. Now they were in their early 30s, but it, it was just really, really cool. They really went all out and had that reunion, and it was it. The I have a a book that shows the reunion and everything. Oh, that is so cool! And what else did you ask so me about? You, know, you had a couple experiences that you remember at Gale School. One of them was oh, yes. in first grade. 
Yeah. Oh, in first grade, I was I was just a little girl, and I had to go to school. And Mama brought me. Well, my dad was driving the uh, station wagon. He t- he drove a uh, school bus for a while. But anyway, I got to the Gale School, and I missed my mama so badly that I went to the corner, and I it had rained a little bit in the morning, and the the, the rain was dripping down the wall, and I would stick my head under the against the wall and catch the water so the kids wouldn't know that I was crying tears. Hmm. Aww. <laughs> years old yeah wow but i had a wonderful first grade teacher she one time i got to school i didn't have my mittens and she gave me a pair of leather gloves to wear mrs cowling no kidding Uh, school at gale school had uh, four rooms it, it was first grade, then second grade, then third grade, and then fourth and fifth. So it was it was a lot of fun at Gale School. And then in the mid-40s, 1945 to be exact, Mom would have been eight or nine years old. Mm-hmm. As we all know, we were in the midst of World War II, and FDR had passed away. And so Mom's got a little story about that. Yes, because um, we all went out or or to the playground and they set the flag at half staff and all the students and the teachers stood around and they were I didn't know why everyone was crying but it was uh, because we had just found out that uh, President Roosevelt had passed away and the, the school held a, a little ceremony around the flagpole for us all. And we played, we used to dig, it was just a dirt road to get up to the school. We used to dig a little hole in the, in the road and play marbles. And we had a swing and that was the only playground we had, any equipment we had. It was, it was really, really good. Grade and school it, was the best. Yes, it was. It was very good. And then we had to start learning. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I, I have to admit that all of our family were very intelligent and good students. They've all been uh, going to college or learning very important positions, including Paul. He's, he's been to China and all over the world. Wow. With his, with his work. Switching gears, there was kind of a, a, a tragedy that happened with your farmhouse, was there not? Yes, it burned. It burned completely. We had, my parents had moved over to my uncle's house in Lochmere uh, because they didn't have any of us kids at home anymore, and there was no point in living in that huge, huge farm and barn and all the work. So anyway, they uh, sold the house and moved to Lochmere. Mm-hmm. And eventually uh, the house complete and the farm completely burned. Mm-hmm. It was very old, and I think they thought that it was probably from the uh, electrical wires that were covered with cloth or however they covered electrical wires at the time. Oh, yeah, that'll definitely do it. So the farm... Burn. My dad had 125 acres, but wow. one of my one of my nieces bought some of the land, and she lives near the farm right now. Very and, cool. Uh, that it's it's still in the family, but not completely. You know, it's not. There's a, a little house that's right on the corner, and uh, it's kind of nostalgic to go through it and see it every time. Oh, absolutely. And you still get all the memories. Oh, yes, yes. And we had campers that came up from Massachusetts. We lived near the lake. Mm-hmm. And go ahead. Uh, so when you guys moved to Lockmere, when the family moved to Lockmere, you guys kind of got really involved in the Lockmere Grange. Oh, we were along before that. As a matter of fact, when uh, my parents moved to Lockmere, they were still in the Grange and very active in it. But None of us kids were of an age to uh, remain in the Grange. They okay, were, they were they were active while they were still living in Beaumont. Now. Oh, oh yeah. no kidding! Okay, okay, gotcha. Oh, yeah, that's where all of our Grange started for our family. My parents had been in the Grange all 
ever since they were married, all of us kids took classes. So let's talk a uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You know what what did your parents do? Well, it, the Grange is called the Patrons of Husbandry, and that is to do with agriculture. And and you mean personally, what did we do as members of the Grange? Right, right. We all held offices. Okay. In the, we were in the juvenile Grange, which is the very youngest group. We had a matron, a lady that would be older. We had, and these are the same offices as all the other uh, granges have the higher ups. We have a master, a, lectric, a lecturer, a steward, assistant steward, lady assistant steward, chaplain, treasurer, secretary, gatekeeper, and a musician. Wow. And my Uncle Roscoe would come down to the Grange Hall. This was when I was little. The only heat in the Grange Hall was two big... Potbelly stoves. Pot, like Potbelly stoves. Like station stoves. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Uncle Roscoe, my dad's brother, would come down and uh, get the hall all warmed up. And then we'd, uh, it was time for the Grange to uh, start its business. And there's a, there's a ritual that you go for in the Grange. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, uh, I was one of the graces. The, the female youth were given roles in the Grange named after Roman goddesses. Mm -hmm. And the purpose was to provide leadership training and life skills training opportunities. We had Ceres, Pomona, and Flora. Yeah, among those were all the others. The lecturer would uh, have to provide a, a game or something for the kids to play mm -hmm. in between the ritual. And the steward would walk around, the, and the assistant steward would walk around, and they would have to get the, they would have to go to each officer and get the secret word that was, that was given up each year. Hmm. And the chaplain would read a prayer, and the treasurer was in charge of the money, and the secretary was in charge of the uh, minutes, and the musician always played this same song. <laughs> Every time she played the same song, but that's all right. <laughs> Nobody complained? No, 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 nobody complained. Oh, not with Mrs. Borden. No, you did not complain. Was that she wasn't like one of those people who would come over and like nail you over the knuckles with a ruler or something, right? No. no okay, good. No. It, it was uh, it was kind of fun. It was it was okay. And yeah. and for the people that are just tuning in, the definition of a grange, a country house with farm buildings. I never knew that before. Oh. I never knew that. Uh huh. The actual formal name of the Grange was the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry. Basically, what it was, was it was a, a group that assisted and lobbied for agrarian issues of the day. Agriculture. Um, agriculture and farming. But equally as important, the Grange was set up to sponsor social activities mm -hmm. and also community service and that starts at a very young age so they had the adult grange so to speak and then they had the children's grange and my mom started her her engagement with the grange as a very young child mm -hmm. and the whole purpose of that was to um, provide leadership training and life skills training so um while the purpose of the Grange was to support farming and agriculture. It was very much a religious-based um, organization. Right. Not and, any particular religion. It just, we had prayers. Sure. And, uh, but the, there was no Catholic or Protestant or anything. It was just a, a, a thing where kids were to realize that we had a God and a Jesus and things like that. Right, absolutely. It kind of reminds me a little bit of, like, of the FFA. Yes. Yes, very much so. Yes, yes, yep. it was. Because I was, I was actually part of the FFA at, at Winnesquam High School. When Doc oh, Schofield, my word. Yep, oh. when Doc Schofield was teaching oh. over there. 
Oh, wow. And uh, I absolutely love that. That's where I learned to drive tractor. You know, we learned to till the fields. I mean, all of that stuff. And, I mean, I enjoyed that. It was so much fun. Yeah, and, and you learn life skills. You don't just learn how to drive a tractor. You learn how to maintain it. How absolutely. To, uh, utilize it uh, to your benefit. You know, as young people, 14, 15-year-olds, we don't know what we want to do when mm-hmm. we grow up. So the more exposure we can have as young people to different things, it provides better guidance for us as we decide what we want to do with the rest of our lives. And FFA is certainly part of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the Grange, uh, you guys had a lot of different activities uh, on top of the meetings. You had weekly card parties. Yes. Uh, There's a lot of stuff you guys did there that sounds like it was really fun. It was. And uh, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, your dad used to play Santa quite a bit, didn't he? Yes, he did. He did. Because I know for me personally, I come by the stuffing naturally. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know if your dad was like that, but I know okay, for me, yeah. no padding necessary. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we did, we'd have Christmas parties, and... Daddy would play Santa and hand out presents that the parents had brought. They didn't let us kids know that they would brought the present. We, they gave it to Santa, and Santa gave us the present. Mm-hmm. And this continued that I thought Santa was real until I was old enough to catch. Right. You know, not, you know I, it was my father who was Santa, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> but as older kids, we still played the game. We never let on to the younger kids. Absolutely. <laughs> and as a little girl, I went on to the stage after Santa came out mm-hmm. and to recite a poem, or I had to recite something. And I started out, I'm not so very small, you see. My wants are very small. And all I want for Christmas was a little baby doll, and I ran off the stage. Were you scared? <laughs> you kind of maybe a little scared of being on stage? Just, oh, just, yes. I was probably six years old or just, so. Just shy. Yeah, not scared. The stage. I totally yeah, I would have done the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And, but and, at the Grange Hall, uh, there were many events that weren't specifically Grange-related. They... they offered the hall to all the townspeople mm-hmm. um, for for any event right. um, as well as you know they had weekly card parties where they'd all get together and play cards and harvest suppers yeah. as well as the the Christmas parties but um, the Grange Hall was really open to any townspeople. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that it wasn't just there for you guys I mean you opened it up for everybody to enjoy. Yes, yes. And uh, it, it, there was a kitchen, and the ladies would always prepare a nice hot meal for us. And, and uh, it, was, it was a good way to grow up, my goodness. I, I can't picture how it would be today. You know, I wish it was the same today. Oh, uh, don't we all? Hey, you know, that's the only thing. Progress is, is one of those things we never truly understand. But the good thing is, at least it's still being used for something wonderful like a senior center. So that's always a good thing. Yeah, so that, with, that kind of ties in with where this whole conversation with my mom and the Grange and the Tilton Historical Society starts. Mm-hmm. And that... Um, in 2015, my uh, my mom's granddaughter's husband, Dan Chapman, you probably know of Bernard Chapman. Yep, sure do. So this is his grandson. Dan was contracted to replace the roof on the shed at the Grange Hall, which had been converted into the Tilton Senior Center. And... Lo and behold, he's pulling off sections of steel roofing and painted in black paint on the silver panels with a paintbrush. It says Roscoe I. Blaisdell, Lockmere, New Hampshire. Oh, my goodness. Of course, 
this is my mom's Uncle Roscoe, her dad's brother. So Uncle Roscoe was a master at the Grange from, I think his first stint was in 1909. And he, uh, he was master for seven or eight years, but one or two years at a time. Um, and uh, as it turns out, Uncle Roscoe was probably involved in building the shed because, of course, he and Mom's dad, my grandfather, Ellis, were carpenters and uh, jacks of all trades. You had to be in that era. Mm-hmm. We surmised that Uncle Roscoe was probably involved in building that shed. So Dan happened to find the roofing set it aside and now sections of that roofing have been distributed throughout mom's family to her uh, nieces and nephews and um, we're trying to keep that kind of connection to uncle roscoe alive and that sort of goes back to the tilton historical society contacted tim rose and what mom found when she went to the Tilton Senior Center was in the entry vestibule, there used to be a framed photograph listing all of the past masters up until when the Grange um, disbanded in 1968. And lo and behold, it was not there. So we contacted Tim and John Sorello at the Tilton Historical Society, and we found it. Lo and behold, it has pictures of my mom's Uncle Roscoe, her dad, Ellis, her mom, Eva, and her brother, David, all past masters of the of the Winnesquam Grange. That is so cool. I love At, that. A little bit more about the Grange. At one point, the, nation, the state Grange invited our juvenile Grange, the younger kids Grange, they invited us to go up to the Colonial Theater in Laconia and we performed the ritual on the stage at the Colonial Theater as young kids and we just thought it was such a wonderful thing to be chosen out of the whole state. We were the only juvenile Grange that uh, provided a program for the state range and uh, I've, got a, I've got a picture of all uh, my three brothers all held uh, positions and I was the flora Melvin was the master and David was the steward and Robert was the gatekeeper Alice was one of the graces yes I was uh, of, of series Pomona and flora I was flora I was probably six or seven years old, and we all had our own special, you know, we have a ritual. Everybody, the each officer has something to say, and they, like the chaplain, will have a little note that will give him a prayer that he can give. And the uh, assistant steward and the lady assistant steward would go around and get the password from all the youngsters. So my mom has a photo of the Juvenile Grange at that meeting at the Colonial Theater with the entire Juvenile Grange on stage. And it includes four members of her family, her older brother Melvin, her older brother David, her older brother Robert, and of course, her. Mm -hmm. So she's very, very proud of that. And now I'm going to be passing that photograph on to Mr. Sorello at the Tilton Historical Society, and they will be stewards of it from now on. Guys, that is so incredible. What a story. I mean, it it sounds like you should have lived like three lifetimes (laughs) with with all of this. I mean, honestly, I, I can't believe how much y'all have packed just into this short life. It's, it's incredible. Can I add just a little bit more about my dad and my uncle? You sure can. Okay, Uncle Roscoe and my dad were brothers and were both handy with a hammer and nails. They mm-hmm. were cops among many other skills. 
and Daddy was an ardent farmer. He had 125 acres to keep track of. But of all of his family, he had uh, three brothers, and Daddy was the only one who married and had children. I don't know why. Daddy and Roscoe would spend every Sunday in the kitchen at the old farm, and Uncle Roscoe would come over and visit every Sunday. He'd sit at one end of the kitchen, Daddy would sit at the other room, of the other side of the kitchen, and they'd be discussing the, discussing the events of the day, politics and things, and Daddy would smoke his pipe and they'd talk, and then all of a sudden they'd both fall asleep in their chairs. <laughs> Uncle Roscoe drove a real old, old, old Model A pickup truck. That Model A pickup truck. And he drove that thing at least up until 1954 when I married because his he was there in this little old truck at so my reception. Uncle Roscoe shows up to the reception in a early Model A Ford pickup truck. Yeah. It must have been 30, it must have been 28 or 30 years old at that time. Yeah. And it looked just like it was brand new. Yeah. Wow. He was all, Uncle Roscoe also was an agent for the Grange Insurance Company. And so that kept him busy. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, he also was the treasurer of the subordinate Grange for many, many years. And at one point, as I got older, old enough to take the duty, they elected me secretary, and I would sit beside my Uncle Roscoe, the treasurer. I was the secretary, and I could write the minutes. I had to write the minutes of each meeting. And boy, did I feel like I was somebody. I can imagine. Yeah. You were living yeah. high on the hog, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, Allison Paul Bladestell, thank you so much for joining us for Talking Tilton. We appreciate it. And uh, I love the stories. It was absolutely wonderful. Well, thanks for your guidance. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been fun talking about it. I love it. My pleasure, guys. And you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, okay? Yes, we will. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Al. You, you got well. it.